Okay, students, welcome to week four of macroeconomics. The key concepts to cover this week include basic macroeconomic relationships, the Keynesian chapter, and the all important chapter on aggregate supply, aggregate demand. All right, so before we get involved with those important economic ideas, I'm going to share my screen with you and discuss some recent economic news. And by recent, I mean real recent this afternoon. So this afternoon, our nation's central bank, the Federal Reserve, met. And what happened? So our nation's central bank controls the money supply. And they control the money supply by controlling interest rates. So the key interest rate that the Fed controls is called the Fed funds rate. And we're going to cover monetary policy at the end of the class, but always important to interject some important macroeconomic news into the class. So the Fed tightened five times last year. They call it restrictive monetary policy. The Fed has raised interest rates in its battle against inflation. So in case you haven't been paying attention to the news or you just haven't gone shopping in the last 18 months, inflation has been a major problem in the economy over the past year and a half. Average price levels increasing much faster than desired. So last week we talked about gross domestic product. We talked about economic growth. We talked about the business cycle. Then we discussed unemployment and inflation. The causes of inflation last year were both demand and supply related. I overstimulating demand for goods and services, most likely because of the uh, slightly excessive fiscal stimulus that the government provided to sustain people through the pandemic and people re-engaging in life after being locked down. Right? On the supply side, lots of supply related issues with global supply chain due to pandemic shutdown and re-emerging from that shutdown. So the Fed today announced it's going to raise its key interest rate, the Fed funds rate, by another 0.25, 25 basis points. So again, this is the sixth straight increase at Fed meetings. The Fed meets once a month. This chart shows us where we were and where we are now as far as the Fed funds rate. So the proper terminology here is the Fed fund, the Federal Reserve targeting this Fed funds rate. So you can see that during the financial crisis, the Fed lowered interest rates to the lowest rate possible to try to help the economy recover from the housing bust and the financial crisis. And then there was a slow but constant economic recovery the Fed started to normalize interest rates in 2016, 17, 18, 19. And then the pandemic hits and the Fed drops rates all the way to the basement again, basically down to zero. And in response to the severe inflation over the last 18 months, the Fed has raised interest rates. So the Fed now has a target range of between 4.5 and 4. 0.75 for the Fed funds rate, the target rate. Now, all other interest rates fall in line with that target rate. So when you go to buy a car and you borrow money, if the Fed raises rates, the Fed funds rate, interest rates on car loans will increase. If you're going to buy a house and you're going to borrow money with a mortgage, interest rates will, mortgage interest rates will increase. And for businesses, and we're going to talk about this tonight, the relationship between the real rate of interest and the expected rate of return, businesses uh, evaluate or examine the relationship between how much they think they'll earn on a new project versus how much it's going to cost them to borrow. So interest rates are important because a decent percentage of economic spending is interest rate sensitive. All right, so let's look more specifically at our week core responsibilities. Week four we cap covers chapters 30 and 32. Notice we do not cover chapter 31, right? So chapters 30 and 32, 
You have the same learning opportunities as every week. You can watch this recorded Zoom video. All right, I'll load it up to YouTube. I'll share the link with everyone. I, you should definitely read chapters 30 and 32 in the textbook and review the lecture notes, right? So those lecture notes, as always, can be found right here as far as your availability right on this PDF file, right? And you can also review these videos I've created on YouTube. This is the chapter 30, economic concepts, basic macroeconomic relationships, right? The Keynesian world, the idea of the multiplier and the investment demand curve, all covered in this video. And then chapter, or sorry, that's chapter 30. And chapter 32 is the aggregate supply, aggregate demand video. So you can review those detailed examination of contents and principles covered this week. As always, the same three academic responsibilities for week four. They are the connect assignments for week four. You need to complete those. You need to participate in the weekly discussion question. For this week, you don't need to read any article or watch any video, right? You need to reflect upon a question, right? So we're going to talk about aggregate supply, aggregate demand briefly, but when you study aggregate demand, which is the total amount of demand by all participants, all buyers, which is consumers, government spending, business spending, and, and net exports, right? So what we're going to say is, what we're going to examine is what areas or aspects influence aggregate demand, especially from the household consumer side. And two of those factors, one's called household indebtedness, or in other words, how much people owe on their house versus how much it's worth. I, the other factor is we call the wealth effect, and that's highly correlated to the performance of the stock market. So when you talk about the discussion question this week, we make an observation that 56% of Americans own stocks and 64% of Americans own a home. Right. So we notice that when we do our examination of economic business cycles, one of the drivers of business cycles is changes in consumer spending based on those two factors I just mentioned, household indebtedness and the real wealth effect. So the 44 percent of Americans who don't own stocks and the 36 percent of Americans who don't own a home are still largely impacted by spending swings that affect the business cycle, drive the economy into recession sometimes. And those people tend to lose jobs and you know, find themselves in difficult economic situations. So this week four discussion question is an opinion question based on the economic principles and concepts we're covering, but it's about fairness. Do you think it's fair that the 44% of Americans who do not own a stock or the 36 million Americans who do not own homes are largely subjected to the consequences of the economic business cycles associated with those types of spending. All right, you have a quiz challenging you to demonstrate understanding of the concepts in chapter 30 and 32. All right, as always, there's multiple choice questions. All right, so make sure you study the concepts in 30, 32. I highly suggest reviewing the lecture notes with lots of problems and example answers, extremely helpful, all right? All right, let's get into a little bit of uh, what it is you need to learn this week. I right, so these are the PowerPoints, which are obviously available in the module. All right, so chapter 30 starts off with basic macroeconomic relationships. Uh, John Maynard Keynes was a British economist who wrote extensively about what caused and what could be a solution to the Great Depression. He was also famous for his contributions to the post-World War I Treaty of Versailles. I don't have time to get into that, but he was not an advocate of severe reparations against Germany. He thought that would lead to World War II. He was absolutely correct about that. But in economic terms, getting back to the, his contributions about the Great Depression and his thinking, Keynes made a, a, a connection between what he, what he said, that, that the macroeconomic relationships. The amount of total spending in the economy and therefore economic activity is highly correlated to the amount of disposable income in the economy. Because after taxes, people can only do two things with their money. They can consume or save. 
So here we have an equation, VI equals C plus X, which simply means that disposable income equals consumption plus savings. Now this might help you some numbers, right? We look and say, okay, if total disposable income is 10 trillion, so let's say the economy produced $13 trillion worth of output and $10 trillion ends up in, in, the, in the hands of the women and men who, 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 who work in America, right? Then after taxes, we say we, we spent nine trillion and we saved one trillion. Keynes made this idea like, okay, the total economic activity in the nation is highly correlated to the amount of disposable income that the economy generates. Because disposable income by default has to equal total consumption, spending on durable goods, non-durable goods and services, plus total savings, All right? That was the Keynesian, model of the economy and he built a model around that now you're not ex you're not you're, you're not responsible to study or explain what he called the aggregate expenditures model but you do have to understand this basic macroeconomic relationship disposable income equals consumption plus savings and from there we move on to what was called the marginal propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to save remember economic thinking is marginal thinking so one of the key concepts in chapter 30 it's going to be an idea called the multiplier. And we need to explain the concepts of marginal propensity to consume and marginal propensity to save in order to work our way up to explaining the multiplier. So assume you made 50 grand last year and you make 55 grand this year. You had a change in income of 5,000. So that's after taxes, okay? We're talking about after tax income. Keynes said, well, you know, out of that change in income, what percentage of it will you spend and what percentage of it will you save? So he called the total percentage of your change in income that you spend the marginal propensity to consume and whatever percentage of the change in income that you save, the marginal propensity to save. So again, some numbers will help clarify this. Say, okay, I made 50 last year after taxes. Now I make 55. So I have an additional $5,000 of income. That's my change in income, right? So remember, marginal propensity to consume equals change in consumption over change in income. So our denominator is going to be five grand. We made an additional five grand. What if I spent four of that five? Well, then my marginal propensity to consume would be 80%. I spent $4,000 of the additional 5,000 I earned for 80%. Therefore, I saved the rest of the additional income, the change in income. I saved 1,000 of the 5,000 or 20% of the change in income. Notice that the marginal propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to save have to equal one. Because right? I spent 80% of my change in income, I saved 20% of it, 80 plus 20% equals 100%, right? Now, these two ideas, marginal propensity to consume, marginal propensity to save, are important because they help us calculate an important economic concept called the multiplier, right? So before we get into the math, here's the idea. John Maynard Keynes looked at the Great Depression and he said, why do things continually get worse? Why aren't things getting better? Why isn't the business cycle and the natural process of lower prices enticing people to spend and he said well you know when spending falls it doesn't fall one one time it ultimately falls by a multiple amount and then he, he tried to calculate the total change of gdp so we call this idea the multiplier and this is his, his concept that really had an impact on macroeconomic thinking so okay any initial change in spending uh, is going to have any initial change in spending is going to have a multiplied effect on total GDP. So let me just give you a practical example. It's okay. I walk into a store and I buy a $5,000 fur coat. So GDP increases by 5,000. But Kane says that's not the beginning and end of the story because now the store owner has $5,000 in additional income. If the store owner spent 80% of that on something else, so let's say, you know, that the, the store owner is like, I've been waiting to buy this piano and I want, you know, I had to sell that coat first. So the store owner sells the $5,000 coat and then goes out and buys a $4,000 piano. You know, he's a, he's, he or she is an expert piano player. 
So what's happened? GDP went up by 5,000 and then by 4,000. And then the piano store owner says, well, you know, I got to go out and I got to go buy, uh, you know, I, I need, I've been, you know, been waiting to put new hardwood floors in my entire house. And that's going to cost me 3,200. So first the economy goes up by 5,000, then by 4,000, then by 3,200. And you see that the initial change in spending has a multiplied impact on total GDP. Right? That's what Keynes meant by the multiplier. Now, with the good Lord giveth, he also taketh away. So a business was planning on spending a million dollars to expand its plant capacity this year. And because they don't have a positive outlook on the economy, they cut that spending. Keynes says, well, that initial change in spending, that cut in spending, will ultimately have a larger negative impact on GDP because that million dollars in spending was going to be an igniter for other economic activity. So the economy falls ultimately by a multiplied amount, not just a single one-off change in spending. So Keynes believed you could actually calculate the size of the multiplier. So after you calculate it, what he calls the marginal French to consume or marginal French to save, we can use either of those to calculate the size of the multiplier, which means I, if we know the initial change in spending, then we can calculate the multiplier, figure out what will be the total impact on, on GDP. So the multiplier is calculated by using either this formula, one over the one minus the marginal propensity to consume, or this formula, one over the marginal propensity to save. Now, this is an easy trick for students. Let's say you hate math. There's a slide here that shows you if you know the marginal propensity to consume, this little cheat sheet tells you the size of the multiplier. So if the marginal propensity to consume is 0.9, in other words, it, on average, Americans spend 90% of their change in income, the multiplier will be 10. If on average, Americans spend 75%, 0.75% of their change in income, the multiplier will be 4. So this cheat sheet's excellent because it helps you easily calculate the size of the multiplier. The other observation is important here, too, is that the larger the marginal propensity consume, the greater the size of the multiplier. So this little problem set here, there's two problems, helps us give an example of what we mean by macroeconomics and the multiplier and total change in GDP. So if we're trying to calculate what the total change in GDP is, we need two pieces of information. We need the initial change in spending, the size of that, and we need the size of the multiplier. So the first question says, how much would a $20 billion increase in investment spending? So by investment spending, we mean a business spends on machines or equipment or plants. They, you know, they, they expand their capacity. So business spending on capital, right? How much will a $20 billion increase in investment spending ultimately total change total GDP if the marginal propensity to consume is 0.9. Now we can do it the long way. We can say one over one minus 0.9 equals the multiplier. One over one minus 0.9 is one over 0.1. One divided by 0.1 is 10. Or we can go down to the cheat sheet and say, I hate math. If the marginal propensity to consume is 0.9, the multiplier is 10. So now we have all the pieces to the puzzle to solve our GDP riddle. The multiplier is 10. The initial change in spending is 20 billion. 10 times 20, the total change in GDP would be $200 billion. So if one company spends $20 billion, which sounds like a lot, but if you look at a big company like Boeing, it's, it's, not, you know, it's not out of the question. If one company spends 20 billion on investment spending, expanding the size of their plant or their, 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 their factory, right? and the multiplier, no, sorry, the initial change is 20, and the multiplier is 10, total change in GDP would be 200. Now, this question is a little tricky because it said, the government wants GDP to increase by 400. So we know this number now. The government wants the total change in GDP to be 400, right? And then it tells us that in the economy, the larger price to consume is 0.8. So we use our cheat sheet. We say, okay, if the marginal price to consume is 
the multiplier is five. So it says the, 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 the the marginal expense to consume is 0.8, which means the multiplier is five. The government wants GDP to increase by 400. How much would the government need to increase spending? Now they would do this if the economy is in a recession. So now we can just do a little bit of math to figure out our answer. If, if, if we want total GDP to go up by 400, all right, here's our 400. And the marginal expense to consume is 0.8. That means the multiplier is five. 400 divided by five, if there's an initial increase in spending of 80, right? Eight times five is 400. If the government increases spending by 80 billion, they'll get their $400 billion increase in total GDP. All right, next and last important concept of this chapter is called the investment demand curve, right? So what we're looking at here is for a business, we're gonna weigh the expected rate of return versus the real rate of interest to determine if our investment makes economic sense. So the expected rate of return, a business will calculate, okay, marketing, finance, advertising, all right, uh, competition in, in, in a specific industry. They're gonna calculate on any project what they think their expected rate of return will be in percentage terms. In other words, okay, if we spend hundred billion dollars to get this product up and running, we expect a return of seven percent annually. Right, so that's their expected rate of return. The real rate of interest we went over this last week is simply the nominal rate or the stated rate minus any expected inflation over that time. So what the investment demand curve does for us, right? We can look at this relationship and we can say, well, we make a very important conclusion. We graph the investment demand curve. And we notice that at low interest rates, there's much more spending by businesses on new projects, on new equipment, on plan expansion, on logistic systems, on any type of capital investment spending that's going to increase the economic activity. Because it's generally a lot easier to find projects where, hey, we can earn more than 2%. So basically we're saying this, if the company can borrow at 2%, they really can find a lot of projects where the expected rate of return is greater than 2%. So low interest rates, 2% interest, a high quantity demanded of investment spending. At higher interest rates, it's nearly impossible to find projects where the expected rate of return is greater than that real rate of interest. So this is the key driver to business investment spending is the interest rate in the economy. That ties right back to what we were just studying, I mean, sorry, commenting on at the beginning of class with the Federal Reserve. Now you might be saying, wait, wait a second. The Federal Reserve's purposely raising interest rates, isn't that gonna slow investment spending? You're absolutely right, it will. The Fed's intention is to actually slow the economy a bit. Now you think about this, interest rates were basically zero, right, during the, the, the COVID crisis, and that made investment spending very attractive. Now interest rates are getting up in the four and a half, you know, the, the, the 5% range, which means there's gonna be what? Less investment spending at that level of interest rates, right? All right, so that's that chapter. Then we move on to the aggregate demand, aggregate supply chapter. So we studied supply and demand. Here is aggregate supply and aggregate demand. All right, so this is a model of macroeconomic equilibrium. Let me say that again. The purpose of this model is to simultaneously investigate the three variables that we are interested in in macroeconomics. We call that macroeconomic equilibrium. And those three variables are the level of real output, AKA GDP, real GDP, which is economic output adjusted for inflation. We went over that last week the level of employment, right? So the unemployment rate, and then the price level. So in this model, we measure economic output, aka real GDP on the horizontal axis. We also measure the unemployment rate on the horizontal axis. So as the economy produces more outputs, unemployment falls. So as we move left to right on the horizontal axis, GDP adjusted for inflation or real GDP, 
is increasing, unemployment rate is decreasing. On the vertical axis, we're measuring inflation, aka the price level. We call it right here the price level. Now we said this last week, but there's several measures of that. I, the Fed has its own measure of inflation, the PCE, personal consumption expenditures measure. I, there's the PPI, which is the producer price index. And the most widely reported is the CPI, the consumer price index. All right, we can throw them all together, or we can just use the CPI, just the average price level in the economy. And we want this to be about 2%. We want economic growth to be about 3%. And we want unemployment to be about 4%. Actually, this right here, this is just say the new estimate for uh, the natural rate of unemployment is much closer to 4% than it is 5%. That's been, it's actually come down in the last few years. So as pictured on the board, where we have aggregate demand intersecting or coming together with aggregate supply, macroeconomic equilibrium, we have economic growth at or near our long run goal of 3%, unemployment at full employment number, the natural rate of unemployment, 4%, and inflation of 2%, right? So what this model allows us to do is, Number one, evaluate the current state of the economy. And then number two, if necessary, and this is where we're, move, is where we're moving towards next week with fiscal policy, make policy changes to affect aggregate demand. All right, well, mostly aggregate demand. We don't, we don't really talk much about uh, policies affecting aggregate supply. A right? little bit, not too much. So just like when we study demand and supply for single markets, we can't study these both at the same time. This is the model, right? We have the model when we bring these two together, but we're going to discuss aggregate demand, then we're going to explain, discuss aggregate supply. So the definition or understanding of aggregate demand is the idea that it's the amount of real output. In other words, it's the amount of GDP that all buyers. So if you are taking notes, what you should do is you should draw an aggregate demand curve like this, and you should write C, I, G, and X. Just like when we studied GDP last week, and we said the expenditures approach, right? All buyers, right? We call that all buyers. So aggregate demand is the amount of real output that all buyers collectively want to purchase at the given price level. So we notice that the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping. In other words, there's an inverse relationship between price and quantity. Right? The, the, the general price level in the economy and the total amount of output that buyers want to purchase. So at slightly lower general price level, there's more desire to purchase output by the collective board buyers. Higher price levels, slow purchasing. The three reasons why the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping is called the real balances effect, the interest rate effect, and the foreign purchases effect. So very quickly going over these, think about real balances and what we call the price level. So imagine if you had money in the bank or you have cash somewhere at your house. It's not bearing much interest, not earning much interest. So higher price levels, inflation actually erodes the purchasing power of that cash. So last year, if you had cash and price level went up, your purchasing power actually declined, right? If price level goes down, your purchasing power actually increases. So we call that the real balance effect. The interest rate effect, if the price of goods and services go up, we need more money to buy things. And therefore, everyone demands more money, which pushes up interest rates. And we just learned that a great deal of economic spending is interest rate sensitive. Finally, the foreign purchase effect. This one's simple. If price level in the United States is lower, other things equal than other countries, people in other countries will buy more of our exports. If price level in the United States increases, exports become less attractive to foreigners. So that's the reason why the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping, those three reasons collectively. Now, we talked about shifts in demand when we talked about single market demand. Increases and decrease. An increase, a rightward shift, a decrease, a leftward shift. In terms of aggregate demand, we had to break it down into 
C, I, G, and X. What will cause the aggregate demand curve to shift or sh to the right increase or shift to the left and to decrease? Let's look at consumer determinants first, households. So again, consumer wealth, this is the part that's on your uh, 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 discussion question this week. Consumer wealth is highly correlated to the stock market. So we call these bull and bear markets, right? When, they, when, when the stock market's doing really well, we call that a bull market. When the stock market has a bad year like last year, we call that a bear market. When stock markets go up in value, people feel better about their financial picture and tend to spend more on things like vacations and home renovations. So any huge increase or significant increase in the value of financial instruments, aka equities or stocks, tends to increase aggregate demand, right? When there's a stock market bust, that decreases aggregate demand. Household indebtedness. From 2000 to 2007, the price of homes was skyrocketing. 2008, we had the housing bust. So from 2000 to 2007, the huge increase in house prices caused an increase in aggregate demand. And the decrease in house prices caused a decrease in aggregate demand, right? Household indebtedness and consumer wealth, probably the two biggest drivers here as far as consumer spending impact on the economy. The other two are easy to explain, consumer expectations. Michigan study puts out a number every year, uh, sorry, every month, and it reflects how the average person in the United States feels about their overall economic well-being. Taxes is simple. We raise taxes, less spending, we, we, we uh, lower taxes, more spending. So stock market booms, increase in aggregate demand. Housing prices increase, increase in aggregate demand. Consumer sentiment improves, people feel better, increase in aggregate demand. Right. House market bust, decrease in aggregate demand. Stock market bubble burst, decrease in aggregate demand. Right. We had one of those in 99, we had another one in 2008. Right. They will decrease aggregate demand. And then if consumer sentiment wanes, decrease in aggregate demand. Now we just went over this for, for, the, for the next component. When you talk about investment spending and how that will impact the aggregate demand curve, it's mostly related to this idea of the investment demand curve that we just studied, right? The relationship between the expected rate of return and the real rate of interest. Key idea though is expected rate of return is influenced by things like how much excess capacity a firm has. So you know, if the, even if interest rates are really low when they're only at 60% capacity use, utilization of their factory, they're not going to go out and rush to get new machines, right? This is a big driver of investment spending, right? A business is far more likely to buy new machines, buy new factories, expand plant capacity if they have a positive outlook about expected future business behaviors. Now, we get down to government, we say, oh, man, look, government, we left this one blank. Right? Why do we do that? All right, well... Yes, government spending will definitely either increase or decrease aggregate demand, but you should probably write this down. You'll we'll be here next week. Government spending is referred to as fiscal policy. So we're going to spend an entire week next week on fiscal policy and the impact that government can have on aggregate demand. So we didn't leave this blank by mistake. We left it blank on purpose. Now, net exports, what's going to affect the amount of exports that American companies sell to foreigners? Two factors, national income abroad and exchange rates. So let's just talk about these two. And let's look at the curves as we do it. National income abroad means the performance of economies around the world. So if the, Euro sorry, if the European economy does better, people in Europe have more income. They're going to spend more domestically. We'll spend more internationally, right? When other economies falter, so uh, the citizens in those countries will have less money to spend. Therefore, there'll be less exports because national incomes abroad have declined. All right, the dollar exchange rate. If the dollar depreciates, that is to say, if 
the value of the dollar declines relative to other currencies, that's actually good for U.S. exports. It makes exports less expensive to foreigners. Right? Last year, the dollar appreciated by about 13% against other major currencies. The appreciation of the dollar was bad for U.S. exports. All right, so we got a pretty good understanding of aggregate demand. Aggregate supply. Right, well, first, it's easy to explain as far as defining aggregate supply. It's the level of real output that all producers want to make available for sale at the given price level or the, the general price level in the economy. But we have two aggregate supply curves. We have the long-run aggregate supply curve right, and the short-run aggregate supply curve. So let's talk about in the long run. In the long run, businesses will make available for sale the level of total output, which is what we call equivalent to full capacity. In other words, remember back to the production possibility funds here. Right? We only have so much land, capital, labor. Right? We only have so much technology. In the long run, we'll maximize economic output based on our fixed resources and quantity and quality and our fixed technology, which means in the long run, the aggregate supply curve is vertical when we reach that or get very close to that limit of production based on fixed resources and quantity and quality and fixed technology. In the short run, we can kind of be out of whack, so to speak. Now, if you look and say, hey, this aggregate supply curve looks slightly different than the one you introduced at the beginning of our, our talk here, when we looked at you know, this aggregate supply curve. Well, this one just has slightly exaggerated to emphasize an important economic point. So, you know, generally we operate between here and here. So the aggregate supply curve looks like the one we went over when we first introduced this model. But I like this exaggerated one because it, it really drives on what we call the three ranges of the curve, the Keynesian range, the intermediate range, and the classical range of the aggregate supply curve. Sometimes referred to as the horizontal range, the upward sloping or intermediate range, and the vertical range. Right. So in the short run, right, the level of real output is going to vary because in the long run, what we have is we have wages and resource prices, they end up matching, right? Wages and resource prices match. And they match, you know, at, at, at the level where you know we're going to maximize production. In, in the, that's in the long run. In the short run, we can have this, this period of time of wages and resource prices mismatch right? because of the business cycle, so to speak. So during a severe recession, the economy is characterized by very little inflation, falling GDP, and high level of unemployment. Right? Because there's a high level of unemployment and GDP is weak, there's very weak demand for resources, and there's very weak demand for final goods and services. Right? That's why there's no inflation. What the economy is, is experiencing is a high degree of what we call slack or excess capacity. So we should be producing all the way out here, but in the Keynesian range, we're in a recession, characterized by falling GDP, high unemployment, no upper pressure on prices, no inflation. Right. Then things get better. As things get better, we put resources back to work. We put people back to work. The economy starts to produce more. Some of that excess capacity gets used up, right? Price level starts to, 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 to increase a bit. The demand for resources increases. People feel better about their jobs and their livelihood and their economic position. They spend more. Businesses feel better about raising prices a bit. But then we hit the proverbial wall, the classical range. Right, just like the long run aggregate supply curves, eventually we hit the wall of how much we can totally produce. So that's why we have a vertical, classical, or, 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 or third range of the short run aggregate supply curve. Right? So we bring down here to this side and said, okay, what will cause the aggregate supply curve to shift to the right or shift to the left, to increase or decrease? We covered that for aggregate demand, what about aggregate supply? Well, a rightward shift in the aggregate supply curve is, is caused by any improvement in technology or productivity, 
for any increase in the quantity or quality of resources. So a rightward shift in aggregate supply curve is the most desirable outcome for the economy, right? It's equivalent to economic growth. A leftward shift in the aggregate supply curve, that's the worst case scenario. Right? And that's caused by what we call a supply shock, a negative supply shock where resources are either unavailable temporarily or they go way up in price, right? And that will cause the, the aggregate supply curve to shift left. So let's bring aggregate demand and aggregate supply back together and then discuss the effects. So remember, this is the Goldilocks scenario, right? We want macroeconomic equilibrium to occur where we have economic growth at about 2.7, 3% somewhere around there, 2.7 to 3%. Unemployment about 4% and inflation about 2%. So this picture of the economy is the Goldilocks scenario. Everything is perfect, right? That's what we want to happen. Unfortunately, we know that things get out of whack in the economy. There can be a decrease in aggregate demand. This is what happened during 2008 when the housing bubble burst and the stock market collapsed, a significant leftward shift in the economy. Well, how does that affect our three variables? A leftward shift in aggregate demand meant GDP fell from 3% all the way down to say negative 2 to 3%. Unemployment, which was 4% here, rose all the way up to 10% here. Now, we look and say, oh, does that cause deflation? Generally, it's disinflation. Remember that term where inflation was 2.8% or 2.2%, then inflation falls to 1%. But we actually did touch the possibility of having deflation during the severe financial crisis. So a leftward shift to the aggregate demand curve can be caused by stock market going kapooey, by bust of the stock market, housing bubble, bu sorry, housing bubble burst, businesses stop spending because they don't see any positive correlation between their investment and their return based on the economic landscape or the economic prediction, you know, predictable future, right? And that causes GDP to fall, unemployment to rise, and there's no upward pressure on prices. Last year, we actually could have had the opposite problem where we have an excess of spending. Aggregate demand starts to increase beyond the economy's ability to produce. Last week, we called this too much money chasing too few goods, right? Or spending beyond the economy's ability to, to continue to make output. And look what happens, right? Yes, GDP can continue to increase somewhat from QF to Q1. Unemployment's not a problem. Unemployment was 4% here, falls to 3.5% here. But look what happens to inflation. Our desired level is 2%. It skyrockets all the way up to 7%. So excess spending beyond the economy's ability to produce causes demand for inflation. Two more scenarios, one good, one really bad. I just talked about that idea of what we call a leftward shift of aggregate supply. So here we are at A, equilibrium A. GDP is 3% growth. Unemployment is 4%. Inflation is 2%. When we have a negative supply shock, Right? That's caused by what? Negative supply shock caused by significant increase in something like the price of oil. Right? Ukraine gets invaded by Russia. Fossil fuels are less available. Right? The supply chain still all muddled up because of the pandemic. Right? So the price of resources skyrockets. This causes a leftward shift of aggregate supply. Right? That's bad for all three of our macroeconomic variables. GDP falls, we're in a recession from QF to Q1. As GDP economic output in real terms declines, unemployment goes up. But people have less jobs at the same time, look what's happening. Inflation, higher price level caused by the negative supply shock. This is cost push inflation. The last case scenario is the best possibility. Any increase in the quantity or quality of resources or any improvement in technology slash productivity. That's why economists are so obsessed with productivity, will cause a rightward shift of aggregate supply. This is known as non-inflationary economic growth. In other words, we produce more, 
more jobs are available, but we don't have upward pressure on price level. Right. All right. So that's going to wrap up our study of chapter 30 and chapter 32. All right. Hit me up if you need assistance with anything. Don't forget to finish the connect assignments, to participate in the week for discussion board, and to finish that quiz. Have a good week. See you next week.